Hello and welcome to today's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Marini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian Tsunami. Tonight we will learn about geological phenomena pertaining to the Asian Tsunami, other tsunamis, etc. in Chapter 12. Today's is Part 1. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading session before starting tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation menstrual hygiene especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal health care access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the developmental agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting on disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. This Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Let us now begin with the chapter on the geological perspective of disaster mitigation. We will st study geological phenomena. Additionally, we will learn about disaster preparedness with the geological perspective. Medical preparedness, administrative preparedness will also be touched upon. Trust me when I say this, the visuals are pretty spectacular. They might not be very inspiring because it's all about disasters, but nevertheless, very it's raw photojournalism with in-depth coverage. This chapter will be concluded possibly in another episode, either next week, because next week there is the Ganesh Chaturthi, so it may come the week after. Bear with me. Paper with standards of disaster mitigation, this chapter will captivate you as much as it captivated me while writing. The mega earthquake that triggered the Asian tsunami was the third biggest earthquake in recorded history and the first in the era of digital broadband data. The earthquake was so huge in the dimensions that it, it is supposed to have impacted every millimeter of the earth's surface. It triggered the massive Asian tsunami which claimed 2,27,898 lives across 14 countries around the Indian Ocean Rim according to the United States Geological Survey. Estimates vary but the economic damage from the Asian tsunami ran into billions of dollars or trillions of dollars. There is a link which is coming up. It, it's a very informative video on put up by the United States Geological Survey on the Great Alaska Sound Earthquake of 27th of March 1964. Uh, this link is also put up at the end of the chapter. See, there it is. Uh, at the end of the video uh, in the description box. Dr. Tad Murthy, Vice President of the Tsunami Society International based in Honolulu, Hawaii, also an adjunct professor of the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Ottawa, Canada told me in an exclusive email interview, on the basis of the analysis of seismological data, hydroacoustic signals, geodynamic environment of tsunami genesis, magnetic images of the crust of the Sumatra region and global positioning systems, etc., it has been found that the Sumatra earthquake, which had a magnitude of 9.1 energy of 1.1 multiplied by 1017 units of nanometers occurred at a depth of 20 to 30 kilometers close to the Indonesian 4 arc. The earthquake rupture had a maximum length of 1200 kilometers along the interface between the Indo-Australian and the Burmese plates. There was a 20 meter earthquake of the fault line and the sea flow thrust up several meters. The earthquake appears to have produced a recognizable pole shift a small change in the length of the day and the oblateness of the earth. Such were the dimensions of this mega earthquake. To make visual sense of this rather scientific and mathematical perspective, you may wish to watch an explanatory documentary on a link which is coming up and will also be put up in the description box below. In the Andaman Sumatra earthquake, the fall rupture on the lithosphere, meaning the ocean floor, Exceeding 1,200 kilometers has released only a relatively small amount of the accumulated seismic stress of subduction of the Indian plate against the Eurasian plate. This is explained by the fact that the fault continues in a north-northwestern direction parallel to the Andaman district of Andaman Nicobar Islands north of the 10 degrees channel. The fault line north of the 10 degrees channel has not released the accumulated seismic stress 
say geologists. Similarly, the seismic stress has not been released on the fault line that runs south southeast of the epicenter of the mega earthquake. That means the fault rupture of the Andaman Sumatra mega earthquake happened all along northwest, no, northwest Sumatra to the west coast of all the Nicobar Islands, stretching a length of about 1200 kilometers on the sea floor. Geologists believe that sometime soon this pending seismic stress will be released, that there is possi a possibility that the next seismic stress release will be somewhere near the epicenter of the 1861 earthquake mega earthquake which also triggered tsunamis. To read more about the 1861 earthquake, you may wish to read up the Wikipedia link which is also going to come up here. Yes, there it is. Uh, it's also put up in the description box below. It, the question remains if all the accumulated stress will be released in one mega earthquake or a seismic event or will there be smaller earthquakes of great magnitude. The mega earthquake of 26 December 2004 created the largest recorded earthquake swarm with more than half a dozen earthquakes triggering around the Nicobar Islands itself on the 26th of December 2004. It can also perhaps trigger volcanic explosions to release the seismic stress. That is the one that is still upcoming or pending. In India's Andaman Nicobar Islands, the second nearest landmass to the epicenter after Sumatra, there were 221 aftershocks within a four week period. Consequent to the subsidence near the epicenter, the Andaman Islands north of the 10 degrees channel heaved up by about 33 feet or 10 meters. Thanks to this upheaval of the Indian of the island landmass, the creeks drained out depriving the mangroves and wildlife thereof their habitat. The Nicobar Islands generally subsided with the Megapore Island completely being swallowed by the sea. It was the only natural ha habitat of the Megapore, a ground nesting a bird endemic to these forlorn volcanic islands. Consequently, according to locals, the Megapore is now colonizing and adapting to new but native environs of the Campbell Bay forests in neighboring Great Nicobar Island. Caretaker of the APWD Inspection Bungalow, Mohan Varek says, Megapore is often sighted in the forests in a Campbell Bay after the tsunami. The upheaval of the Andaman Islands and subsidence of the Nicobar Islands have had an impact on fauna like pelagic fishes, that means oceanic fishes, estuarine crocodiles, birds and butterflies. I'll wait for these fishes to finish for the sequence. We will read about invasive colonization in greater detail in chapter 16 on the impact of the tsunami on biological and zoological uh, species. The tsunami also changed the course of ocean currents. The Trinket Island in Middle Nicobar group of islands in Nicobar district of Andaman Nicobar Islands got trifurcated wow, with landmass heaving off and collapsing into the sea. That's the Trin Trinket Island there. The collapse of land masses affected corals, currents and rainfall patterns. And rainfall patterns. The Trinket Island is deprived of the beach after the, after the Asian tsunami, having a severe impact on marine turtles. Birds are also affected. Though estuarine crocodiles have not been sighted in any of the Nicobar Islands except perhaps Campbell Bay, their nesting sites and migrating corridors are also possibly affected. Scientific documentation is pending. In this picture, shot from the helicopter, where did you come? In this picture that I shot from the helicopter, part of the Trinket Island having collapsed into the sea is visible. Since uh, my visit to Trinket Island was not facilitated by the island ed administration, there is no first person account and quotes from the only one family that lives in Trinket, I am afraid. However, a decade after the tsunami, the beaches have started formation again, said Aslam Beg, the grandson of the Queen of Islam of Nankauri, in an exclusive interview to the author, in, that is me, in the Komorta Island. The popul that's the Queen of Islam there. The population of the island was decimated. Today, only one family lives there, trying to be independent of government support and subsidies, according to Mr. Aslam Bey. The geological challenge transpires to the fact that there are no ship or boat landing facilities like infrastructure, 
like Jetty, Wharf, Pyre, or Poor. For just one family, the government of, of India apparently found it unviable to invest in infrastructure and the family is forced to live off grid. The Great Indian Ocean earthquake of 2004 resulted in significant ground deformation including uplift and subsidence in the Andaman Nicobar Islands including Ka Nicobar. The ensuing tsunami which devastated the coastline of Ka Nicobar washed away huge boulders lying on the shore at Savai Bay in section in the northern part of the island, says a geological assessment of the impact of the Asian tsunami. In an article in Current Science, impact of the 2004 tsunami on the geology of Karnikoba Island under the scientific correspondence category in the 25th of April 2011 issue of Current Science. Current Science uh, number 100 or uh, uh, volume number volume 100 number 8 on 25th April 2011 by authors V. Sharma and Shailaja Bajpai. I, I write here now my experience of boarding and alighting a boat at Rajiv Nagar in the Campbell Bay in Great Nicobar Island. The purpose of writing this is to share with you readers and viewers the field conditions experienced by me firsthand to treat the content with journalistic rigor and bring the reality to the, rigor, to the reader as much as possible. This first hand reporting includes hazards of living in the beautiful isolated islands. I had to visit the resettled Nicobari's family of Mr. Sita Ram in Rajiv Nagar in Campbell Bay. Boarding a forest department patrol boat in Campbell Bay was a dramatic circus with many trials and errors at high tide. Finally, I had to heave myself off the steps on the pyre into the boat with the help of very understanding personnel of the forest department. The difficulty is on account of the fact that I am physically challenged on my left side, but I must say a bit of supportive infrastructure will not hurt even the fittest of passengers. The boat ride was about 40 minutes across the bay to arrive at Rajiv Nagar. There again, the pyre was way too high to climb from the boat, so the boatman, realizing my difficulties, preferred to land on the beach. But then about 20 meters before the beach, he stopped the engine so that he can wait for a pontoon or a catamaran to transfer from the patrol boat to land at the beach. The spot at which the boat had stopped was rich with coral, so we ought not to tread on it. So there was no question of alighting from the forest department patrol jeep to the sea. Uh, the guard swam across swiftly to the beach, walked to the shoreside encampment of Mr. Sitaram's family, and then Mr. Sitaram, his son Kimus, and two other grown-up boys carried a very attractive-looking catamaran till the sea and set it afloat. By then I had packed my camera bag into my photo coat and the forest guard waded through chest deep water holding my camera bag aloft on his upheld arms. He took it across the reef to the beach and kept it safe on a dry rock. He was mindful and took care not to let a drop of sea water come in contact with my camera bag wrapped flimsily in a photo coat. The forest guard steered the catamaran to the petrol boat's leeward side to help me transfer. It was, a, it was hot, humid noon time at high tide in March 2014, on the 5th of March if I remember right. The rambustious sea would not let the catamaran hoist itself steadily next to the patrol boat. I had to sit on the rim of the patrol boat to gingerly place my right leg on the catamaran. I managed. However, pulling my shy left leg over the rim to the, to the catamaran was the theatrical part of it all. As I was lifting my left leg off the patrol boat, the tide separated the catamaran from the patrol boat. I screamed in horror. Kimus and the forest guard reassured me that nothing would happen. Perhaps nothing would happen to the sea, but what about me? I can't even imagine. The sea was an aquamarine blue and beckoning in the midday sun. Even if I were to fall into the shallow reef, uh, but still, it was a little too deep. Uh, but it was horrifying to have the boat wear off while I was transferring from the boat, boat to a catamaran on the sea. The depth was 8 meters. I closed my eyes, drew a deep breath, thanked the Lord above for all his support given to me by these kind people and landed myself on the catamaran. It wobbled a bit, but the exercise had left me perspiring. I had palpitations, I was exhausted and drained. The return journey on the catamaran to the patrol boat after my interviews was equally dramatic and exhausting. All the more challenging because I had to climb up from the catamaran to the patrol boat on chest deep waters on a coral reef. And then the landing back in Campbell Bay. The boatman seeing my difficulties brought us to a beach for a hop, skip and jump to dry land at low tide. It was admittedly relatively easier but for me it was plainly put very challenging. Ah. 
I would consider this experience one of the three high points of adventure while researching for this book. But well, I had to get off the boat even if it meant crawling over, for hopping, skipping and jumping was definitely not for me. Uh, a bit of stretching, crawling and sliding and then dropping my legs into the shallow waters helped me survive. Off Campbell Bay in Great Nicobar Island, of Nicobar group of islands, that is in the southern group of islands in Andaman Nicobar Islands. However, there is a surprising uplift of a rocky outcrop. Possibly the only place in Nicobar where there has been an uplift after the mega earthquake of 26th of December 2004. It is, it's going to come up that we should. It's a fascinating place. It is not clear if this rock heaved up in the mega earthquake of 26th December 2004 or was, there, was it there earlier. This is the rock I'm talking about. In the northern district of North Andaman uh, near Rangat, however, though the landmass of the island heaved up by 10 meters in the mega earthquake, the rocks in the sea just off the coast does not seem to have heaved up correspondingly. Uh, those visuals from Andaman will come up in a second. Uh, this is in Nicobar. There is, a lit there is little documented history of tsunamis in the Indian Ocean prior to the devastating event of 2004. This is the Andaman, uh, in the North Andaman the district upheaved, I mean the rock upheaved. It was, uh, there is little documented history of tsunamis in the Indian Ocean prior to the devastating event of 2004. Prior to 2004, a major Indian Ocean tsunami occurred in 1883. It was triggered by the Krakatau supervolcanic eruption and records suggest that a 2 meter tsunami touched that Krakatau, touched the port of Madras, now Chennai. When compared to 2004, the Indian Ocean coastal population densities in 1883 were low and the potential for destruction was minor. While both the 1883 and the 2004 tsunamis reached heights of at least 30 meters, the 1883 tsunami killed fewer people at approximately 36,000 people in and around Jakarta in Indonesia than, than in comparison to the 2004 tsunami. Unfortunately, the recent occurrence of a major Indian Ocean tsunami does not indicate that the ocean will not generate another major tsunami for another 100 years. Research indicates that major earthquake, that a major earthquake with the potential to create another old large o tsunami in the Indian Ocean could occur within a few decades or less. Indeed, the occurrence of a magnitude 8.4 earthquake off the coast of Indonesia, Sumatra Island in December 2007 renewed concerns that another earthquake with the potential to create a devastating tsunami could occur in the near future. This earthquake occurred in the Sunda Trench along the section of fault known as the Mentawai Fault and could signal the end of a long period of calm. The Mentawai Fault has a history of following a cycle in which it produces no earthquakes for about a century and then generates moderate earthquakes over several decades before culminating in a major earthquake. The September 2007 earthquake of magnitude 8.5 may mark the beginning of a period punctuated by moderate earthquakes that is likely to culminate in a major earthquake and possibly devastating tsunami. Fortunately, the 2007 earthquake did not generate another destructive tsunami, says the WHO report of the Asian Tsunami 2004, a comprehensive analysis. The link of this is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below the video. Previous major earthquakes have occurred further north in the Andaman Sea and further south along the Sumatra, Java and Sunda segments of one of the Earth's greatest fault zones the subduction zone known as the Sunda Trench. This great trench extends for about 3,400 miles or 5,500 5, kilometers from Myanmar, that is Burma, south past Sumatra and Java and east towards Australia and the lesser Sunda Islands ending up near Timor. That's that's Indonesia for you. The slippage and plate subduction make this region highly seismic. The volcanoes of Krakatau, Tambora and Toba, well known for their violent eruptions, are byproducts of such tectonic interaction. The earthquake of March 28, 2005 was probably triggered by dynamic stress loading caused by the 26th December 2004 M9 earthquake. The 28th March earthquake occurred as a result of thrust faulting on the boundary of the Australian and Sunda plates. It was caused by the release of stresses when the Australian plate subducted and perhaps rotated beneath the overriding Sunda plate. The interaction results in convergence at the Sunda trench and involves oblique movement which is part thrust faulting along the pale plate boundary and involves both slip perpendicular to the trench axis 
but also strike slip faulting on the Great Sumatra Fault on the island with the orientation of that slip also paralleling the Great Sundar Trench, concludes Dr. George Pararas Karayanis on his web page called the Tsunami Page. The link of this is put up here as well as in the description box below the video. On the 28th of March 10, 2005, another major earthquake occurred near the epicenter. I think that link didn't come up here, it will come up in the description box. On the 28th of March 2005, another major earthquake occurred near the epicenter of the mega earthquake off the west coast of Sumatra. It was not considered part of the aftershocks of the mega earthquake of 26 December 2004, rather an independent standalone seismic event of M8.6 that nevertheless triggered another tsunami and claimed 1,313 human lives. There were guesstimates that the death toll would rise to 2,000 according to Dr. George Karayanis on Tsunami page. It is presumed to be rupture of accumulated stress, seismic stress of Indian plate against the Eurasian plate. The distribution of the larger aftershocks indicates that the two tectonic plates slipped for about 160 to 200 kilometers along their boundary. The aftershocks extend from 0.1 north to approximately 2.5 to 3 degrees north latitude. Therefore, the length of the overall rupture is estimated to be about 160 to 200 kilometers southeast of the rupture of the M9 earthquake of December, 20, December 26, 2004. Even if, like the 1861 earthquake off the southwestern coast of Sumatra, a tsunami spreads towards the Indian Ocean, it is difficult to forecast accurately both the path of the consequent tsunami and the magnitude of that earthquake which will determine the strength of the tsunami. If there is one such mega earthquake or a great earthquake or a subduction earthquake on the Mentawai Fault in the southwest of Sumatra, it can trigger another deadly ocean-wide tsunami in the Indian Ocean. Given that on the 28th of March 2005, another massive subduction earthquake of M8.6 occurred just southeast of the epicenter of the mega earthquake of 26-12-2004, Deduction points to the possibility of release of seismic strength in the same direction, further southeast on the Mentawai Fault at a later date. The slippage occurred along a section of the Great Fault that parallels the Sundar Trench. The rupture started near the epicenter of the western ports of North Sumatra in the vicinity of the Niaz Island uh, and progressed in a southeast direction along a pre-existing major fault the same segment that ruptured during the 1861 earthquake and generated a locally destructive tsunami. The region where the great earthquake occurred on the 28th of March 2005 marks the seismic boundary formed by the movement of Australian plate as it collides with the Burma subplate, which is part of the Eurasian plate. As previously reported, the Indo-Australian tectonic plate may not be as coherent as previously believed. According to recent studies reported in the Earth and Planetary Science Letters, Volume 133, it appears that the two plates have separated many million years ago and that the Australian plate is rotating in a counterclockwise direction, putting stress in the southern segment of the Indian plate as well as on the western section of the Burma plate. The fault in the middle and southern parts of west, south of west coast of Sumatra too were not ruptured. Geologists believe that this portion of the fault has not yet released the full accumulated seismic stress. The potential for another ocean-wide tsunami to be triggered off the west coast of Sumatra is realistic and bears significance to disaster managers. Obviously, a recurrence cannot be so expensive in humanitarian terms. So, let's have a checklist for disaster preparedness for the Indian Ocean Rim states. Now, regular testing and monitoring efficacy of early warning signals in all territories in the Indian Ocean is required. Demarcation of evacuation routes, evacuation infrastructure like mass transport vehicles, broadcast of early warning, dissemination of early warning bulletins through official media the highlight the day and highlight the dangers of unofficial dissemination. And wait for that visuals to catch up. Monitor social media during emergencies to prevent wrongful dissemination. Well maintained uh, ventilated and sanitized temporary shelters. Mock drills every week. Medical preparedness in every primary health care unit. Infrastructure for food warehousing and adequate water supply proportionate to population densities. Stockpiling of civil supplies, food rations and medicines. Training of search and rescue teams, exclusive search and rescue helicopter services, 
Therefore, there is a need to complete and back up data on bathymetric profile of the vast Indian Ocean. Applications of geospatial technology need to be deployed for better administrative coordination in land use planning in tsunami genic and disaster prone areas. The northwest coast of Australia will be vulnerable to any tsunami that may be triggered by mega subduction earthquakes off the southwest coast of Sumatra or the southern coast of Java in Indonesia. When the Krakatau supervolcano erupted in August 1883, the bubble that was created by the steam from the lava that was floating on the sea burst. Consequent uh, explosion broke the sound barrier and was heard in Perth in southwestern Australia, 3,000 kilometers away. The only reason the tsunami triggered by the Krakatau supervolcano did not claim many lives was because the population back then was far lesser. Hence, disaster managers of the Indian Ocean Rim states can never be too well prepared for the disaster that may be triggered by a greater tsunami from a potential megathrust earthquake somewhere off the coast of southwestern Sumatra. However, around 60 to 90,000 people are said to have died in the 1755 Lisbon earthquake triggered this by a tsunami, triggered, which triggered the tsunami, sorry. When an enormous earthquake hit Lisbon in 1755, the city's terrified citizens rushed to the shore for safety. They were amazed to see seawater rushing, rushing away from the shore. Minutes later, a tsunami arrived. 90,000 residents were killed, according to the website Random History the link of which will be coming up here and also in the description box below. Now let me draw attention to the lacunae in disaster preparedness in the Indian Ocean archipelago. There are lacunae in the early warning systems in the Indian Ocean Rim countries a decade after the tsunami, almost two decades now. There are these are intermittent power supply in Nicobars, unautomated early warning sirens in Sumatra, the run-up power supply, the run-up levels of the Asian tsunami in coastal Banda Aceh makes coastal denizens in Banda Aceh the most vulnerable. They hardly have 15 minutes time to evacuate to safety shelters. But then again, it is impossible to forecast the epicenter of the next mega subduction earthquake. There is thus a need to monitor seismograph readings on a fortnightly basis to measure the seismic stress buildup. Thus, the paths to safety shelters uh, must be sanitized. Clear of all this, uh, hindrances like encroachment and kept free of traffic congestion so notorious in South Asian countries. Better eco-friendly infrastructure should be in place in such areas for speedy and effective evacuation. The next mega earthquake or subduction earthquake is likely to have an epicenter in Mentawai Fault on the islands straddling the west coast of Sumatra, say geophysicists. It thus helps to map bathymetric data and keep all early warning infrastructure on standby. Uncluttered evacuation routes sanitized from traffic congestion is absolutely necessary in Sumatra because tsunamis can strike, with, strike within 15 minutes of a mega earthquake or eruption of a volcano in Sumatra. Escape time is very small in Sumatra because of its location at the vortex of a triple junction of fault lines. The routes should not be used during peacetime but only maintained very well. Legal loopholes in data sharing for early warning have to be addressed. Fall deeps, also very geographically challenged, lacks adequate infrastructure for effective search and rescue in its far-flung coral islands. Maldives need to invest more in training research and rescue pilots, helicopter services exclusively for winching disaster refugees in the widespread archipelago. India's Lakshadweep and Minikoi Islands are also vulnerable to lacunae in the effective search and rescue. In India's Andaman Nicobar Islands, early warning of a tsunami forecast is still not being broadcast over state-managed All India Radio and Doordarshan one whole decade after the Asian tsunami, despite India owning state-of-the-art tsunami forecasting center. When India's India, Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services can issue SMS alerts for tsunami forecasts, why cannot this be done by state-run Bharat Sanchar Nigam Limited, that is the mobile telephony company? The SMS alerts for islanders of Andaman Nicobar Islands on earthquakes and tsunami forecasts are already available to subscribers today. But the similar SMS alert to cell phones is customers broadcasting early warning can be very effective in saving lives. Why cannot this be ordained by the government? It should not be a subscriber service, it has to be a mandatory broadcast on SMS. 
Maldives is also very vulnerable to climate change and disasters emanating from extreme weather events and hydrometeorological disasters. Maldives need to take up ecological mitigation measures to prevent disasters from hydrometeorological calamities. Maldives also suffers from cyclones. Sri Lanka needs to regulate its traffic chaos and identify evacuation routes from away from arterial routes. For flash floods to be prevented in dry arid zones and coastal belts, which are also vulnerable to coastal incursion and sea level rise, bioshields management, watershed management and ecological soil restoration needs further political will and support. The drainage parts of flood prone rivers ought to be freed from the encroachment. Encroachment means enjoying the patronage of corrupt politicians and officials to the detriment of the larger political will or general will of the society. These lacunae ought to be fixed without further delay so that when the next mega earthquake or subduction causes a tsunami, the vulnerable populations and the administrator, administrators are better prepared. Apart from volcano and tsunami, the Indonesian Four Arc as well as Andaman Nicobar Islands are vulnerable to a whole host of co-seismic activities like sinkholes, geysers, water spouts, hot springs, landslides and of course volcanoes. Lack of documentation does not mean the problems do not exist. Having said that, there is no clarity or study of the geological impact of the after effects of the Asian tsunami at least in the Andaman Nicobar Islands. Land subsidence, in particular the formation of sinkholes, is a natural phenomenon known to occur in Thailand in areas with a limestone substrate. Over time, water dissolves the limestone and forms caves. The stability of the roof of the cave depends on a number of factors such as the proximity of a fault or the hydrostatic pressure of the underground water. Strong vibrations such as earthquakes can trigger the collapse of unstable or weakened caves. Sinkholes are usually not frequent. However, between the earthquake of 26 December 2004 and 24th of January 2005, 25 sinkholes have been reported, an unprecedented frequency. 17 of them were reported in the six tsunami affected provinces. Sinkholes have not caused any casualties but have damaged infrastructure. Two schools had to be closed. The Department of Mineral Resources of Monre is currently mapping vulnerable areas, says the UNEP report after the tsunami. The link of it is put up there. Uh, sinkholes developed uh, rapidly in the weeks and months following the mega earthquake and the Asian tsunami in the period between tectonic uplift and rebound. 17 sinkholes were recorded in the six tsunami affected provinces of Thailand. 93 sinkholes have appeared in Sumatra and an undocumented amount of sinkholes have appeared in Nicobars. Sinkholes developed Sinkholes can be dangerous to humankind as it can appear anywhere, anytime for no understandable reason. Sinkholes have accounted for the disappearance of human beings, cattle and livestock, goods and services of human use, etc. Geologically, an allied co-seismic activity like tectonic rebound have accentuated, have accentuated sinkholes with further which further causes movement of magmas, hot springs, geysers, water spouts, subduction of, or uplift, change of course of rivers, etc. Unlike in Thailand, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Seychelles, Maldives, etc., the UNEP did not conduct impact assessment of India because they did not have access. As of mid-November 2014, no information was available on sinkholes in, uh, in Andaman Nicobar Islands, uh, so no information about sinkhole preparedness either. Uh, DC uh, Sakshi Mitra told me simply, we have no information about this. I myself have discovered many sinkholes in Karnikobar, Komorta and Campbell Bay and attempts to say, make sense out of it were thwarted by the administration unfortunately. Uh, I have nevertheless published an article uh, about sinkholes and the link of it is going to come up right now. Uh, there is another article on sinkholes published in the BBC which will also be coming up soon. And that is all for tonight. Uh, thank you so much. We have finished part 1 of chapter 12 on the geological perspective. Do tune in for the live interaction at 7.30 p.m. on 4th of September 2021 Indian time for a live interaction. Please do subscribe to our channel. Do share the videos in your networks and circles. Stay home, stay safe and be safe and keep smiling. Thank you for tuning in. Take care.